What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of The Drop. Greg Wyshynski, Ardo Cal, ESPN's Hockey Podcast, twice weekly, Tuesdays and Thursdays, wherever you get your audio podcasts, as well on the NHL on ESPN YouTube. We are getting very close to the start of the regular season. We have plenty of preview content for you already. Eastern Conference, Western Conference. You want a fun interview with Carolina Hurricanes owner Tom Dundon and how we rat ourselves out for not talking about the Hurricanes enough? That is right now available in our archives. We have another great interview on this show coming up with the recently retired Corey Schneider. I could listen to that guy talk for hours. My goodness, he does a deep dive on a lot of cool things. You're going to want to stick around for that. But wish we have a couple of clips that have mm -hmm. surfaced from the hockey world in the uh, in in recent days uh, that you would like to shine a spotlight on. So why don't you start us off, bud? I do, I do. It's great to be back on a podcast because, as you know, it's an audio medium and we can listen to things as well as watch them. <laughs> Let's start off with something we're going to listen to. We're going to listen to the Chicago Blackhawks fans in a game against the Detroit Red Wings this week. And let's listen to what these fans may or may not be chanting, Arda. Win in the win column. Love to see it at home. We've got, is it We Want the Cup going? Do you see right now? Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't quite hear what they're saying. <laughs> Something Detroit. Oh, is that what it is? 100% clearly we want the cup and completely appropriate because Connor <laughs> Medard is my pick for Con Smythe winner. Uh, book it right now. All right. I said it here first. It is October 4th, Greg Wyshynski, <laughs> and Connor Bedard is winning the Con Smythe trophy. So let me let me <laughs> offer a slight counterpoint, which is that while it may sound like we want the cup, the cadence and the phonics also make the chant of detroit sucks so while the on the air it was identified as we want the cup someone else in the air said it may be about detroit i tend to believe using my encyclopedia brown detective skills that it was detroit sucks being it was the end of the third period and a blackhawks win over the red wings however i will say this in the history of hockey hubris a fan base that just drafted the first overall pick chanting, we want the cup in a preseason game. I would allow that. I would allow that every time if a fan base wanted to be that swaggery and do that in a preseason game. But alas, Arda, I don't believe that was the case. I'm going to side with maybe the seven people in the crowd that were chanting, we want the cup. It was like the uh, Hans moment. <laughs> I was saying boo earns. I'm going to just side with them for this moment. Um, what we, You got one on Trevor Zegris as well. Yeah, let's hear Trevor Zegris of the Anaheim Ducks. He signed a big three-year extension. Uh, he did a press conference recently, such as it is with the Anaheim media, uh, and had this to say about his new head coach, Greg Cronin. I feel like we have a pretty good relationship uh, to start things off. And um, yeah, like you said, systems is going to be something that I'm going to have to pick up on. But uh, a lot of good teammates in here who are definitely going to help me out. So. He was just on the ice giving you a couple words, too. I saw, uh, what, what was he telling you? <laughs> How to play defense. <laughs> uh, we were doing some shuffle around the uh, around the dots. First thing he did was take my stick and throw it in the corner, which I thought was definitely interesting, but uh, we'll work through it for sure. All right, so that's a funny clip. I love that he's teaching him defense, and he kind of <laughs> chuckled there. Uh, so Trevor Zegris, three-year deal. 5.75 milli AAV. What do you think of the contract wish? I think it's a good bridge for both. I think for Zegris, obviously being an RFA at the end of the deal, if he blows up offensively, if he's a point per game guy at the end of this deal, he's going to do fine by himself. But I also really like it from a Ducks perspective for two reasons. One, I know that it's in vogue to sign all your young players to big money deals for like eight years and retain them and make sure that that, that whole thing is settled. But I also think that taking a cautious approach with a player like Zegris is a good idea. The man just joked about his defense. He knows what the deal is. He's all a, he's all O, no D right now. And I think it's fair for the Ducks to kind of take a step back and say, what do we really have with Trevor Zegris? We know he's a brilliant offensive player, a dynamic offensive player. If you can't play D by the end of three years, 
what do we really have with them? And also, they've got other salary considerations in mind, Arda. I mean, it's not going to just be Zegris. They still have to give Drysdale, as we do this podcast, a deal. You know, down the road, it's going to be Mason McTavish. Further down the road, it's going to be Leo Carlson. So they've got other salary obligations with young players in mind. No need to set the rate now. Give them the bridge. Figure it out later. Very Jade Cargill in pro wrestling vibes on this one. <laughs> Jade Cargill leaves AEW, joins WWE, huge press release, uh, goes viral, just like Trevor Zegris, right? Trevor Zegris is an attraction in the NHL. Numbers aside, people love watching this guy because at any moment he can give you one of the biggest highlights possible. And he has in NHL history. He will always be attached with the, the Dishigan. And that deservedly so. And here's the thing, though. Jade reports to the Performance Center, you know, getting some uh, reps in, learning the ways, making her way up the ranks of WWE, not starting at WrestleMania, even though people are thinking about that. Trevor Zegers, very similar. He's a 20-goal scorer. But was he worth, or what, did, did Pat Verbeek and company believe he was worth a long-term deal does he need to prove more does he need to adapt more to your point about his coach saying you need to figure out some defense here the potential is there the possibility is there i agree with you i like the term because this gives not only the team but trevor zegras some opportunity to really get to that next level overall especially with the fundamentals and and what they want to see from him on the ice yeah, I think the difference for me is I, I know Jade Cargill knows she has to learn a little bit more ring fundamentals before she wrestles Becky Lynch. I'm not entirely sure Trevor Zegers thinks he has to win a face-off. <laughs> like, I, think, I think this guy knows what he wants to do in this league, and it may not necessarily be to take care of the other end of the ice, although he should take a clue from his good friend Jack Hughes and know that a great defense means an even better offense. Jack Hughes ain't getting the 99 points last year were it not for the fact he became an absolute pickpocket in the neutral zone in his own defensive zone. So mm. take a clue from Jack Trevor, play a little D, go as well with your O, and then both of you guys could be on the Olympic team one day. How exciting would that be? Uh, the T I don't want to talk about the Olympics and Team USA versus Team Canada <laughs> right now. Okay, we're putting that aside, all right? Uh, what I will say is that I have a very surprising pick regarding an NHL award and Jack Hughes, which oh. leads us to our NHL awards prediction segment. The 2023-24 NHL season is upon us, which means it's time to predict who might take home the hardware at the end of the season. So the first thing I'd like to mention is, wish you are a Professional Hockey Writers Association voter. You vote True. on these awards or certain awards. So what, what when people are thinking of how to select players, even if they're just doing it in conversation or trying to predict how the vote will happen, what is your advice on what to look for? I'm not just a voter, Arda. I'm like a scholar on the NHL awards. I'm like those guys that run like Oscar podcasts, like gold derby that can tell you who won best actor uh, in, in like 1973. Master class is you, right? You're the master class guy. I am the master class. Exactly. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm almost like an NHL awards handicapper. And let me tell you what I've learned <laughs> through all these years of covering the awards races, a couple of little bits of information for you. First of all, their time to win is a very real thing when it comes to the media and voting on these awards. The media loves to bestow an award on a player that's been in the mix for them for a while, but hasn't won one. It happens with the Norris Trophy all the time. I think post Patrice Bergeron, it's going to happen with the Selkie Trophy as well. Just read the tea leaves a little bit, put your ear to the ground, and just listen to who the media is talking about before the season as being quote-unquote due. Number two, the Calder Trophy for Rookie of the Year, it hates goalies. Absolutely hates goalies. Only two goalies have won the Calder in the last 20 seasons. Andrew Raycroft in 2004 and Steve Mason in 2009. There have been goalies that have made the, the, the top three. I mean, Stuart Skinner made it last year. Alex and Delkovich a couple of years ago. But actually winning the Calder Trophy is a tough, tough thing for goalies. And finally, speaking of goalies, only two goalies have ever won the Vezina Trophy in seasons in which their teams did not make the playoffs. Connor Hellebuck in 2020, uh, keep in mind the Jets lost in the qualification round in the COVID playoffs. And then Sergei Bobrovsky in 2013 in the lockout shortened season. So even when they do win the Vezina Arda, it's in weird truncated seasons. So you got to be in it to win it when it comes to the GMs voting on the Vezina. 
Uh, shout out to Steve Mason of my hometown, Oakville, Ontario. Oh, uh, wow. All right. Goaltender as well. Uh, so nice uh, name drop there with Steve Mason. Uh, but let's keep that in mind about the Vezina, okay? Like everything you just mentioned there about the Vezina and not making the playoffs, let's just hold that thought okay. as we move forward into our trophies and our very, very early predictions. The Norris Trophy, as we know, goes to the best defenseman. In many recent years, Greg, it has literally gone to the defenseman that has the most points. Let's be honest. That is definitely a consideration as it pertains to this particular trophy. Who do you have? Uh, penciled in for the Norris this year? Well, my favorite is probably the guy who will end up with the most points or at least the best points per game average. And that's Kale McCarr of the Colorado Avalanche. Did not win it last year. Could probably win it every year. I, I think McCarr could easily go on a Nick Lidstrom-esque run with the Norris and just keep winning Norris after Norris after Norris. He's that good if he stays healthy. He's my favorite. My long shot, Rasmus Dallin of the Buffalo Sabres. That guy falls very much into the Maybe it's their time to win category. I think if the Buffalo Sabres do qualify for the playoffs, like many believe they could, then you're going to see Rasmus Dallin get a lot of love from the voters for the Norris. So we will pick a favorite and a long shot for each category. My favorite is the other guy that Kale McCarr will be essentially battling for this trophy with for years to come, Adam Fox. Uh, he's always in the mix. He's always in the running for this trophy. So I'm just going to pick him to be a contrarian. Kale McCarr is obviously the best defenseman in the league, but you know what? That doesn't matter if another defenseman that's in the vicinity is having a blockbuster year, and Adam Fox can certainly yeah, do that. He's proven absolutely. that time and time again. My long shot is Quinn Hughes. I like the narrative Ooh, around him. I like okay? it. I like the narrative around him, man. Like, I love the idea. Like, like a lot of this is based on story, too. Like, you were mentioning, yep. like, their time to win, but also the narrative, the idea that he's the captain of this team. What if the team has success? What if he has a great year? What if his numbers are terrific? And what if he is seen as essentially a major reason why this team makes the playoffs? That will certainly give him consideration, at least a possible nomination, uh, if all of those stars sure. align for Quinn Hughes. And also... Keep this in mind. Just keep that last name in mind as we go on through these categories. <laughs> uh, that's yeah, all I'm going to say. Almost a point per game for defenseman last year. So, I mean, he's he's right on the runway for it. Uh, moving on to the Vezina Trophy. My favorite is UC Soros of the Nashville Predators. Uh, he's a guy that should have been in the top three last year. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the GMs love a guy who plays a lot of games and gets a lot of wins. Now, I don't think he's going to be amongst the leaders and wins necessarily, but he is going to play a lot of games. And I, I as we talked about last week in the Western Conference preview, I do have the Predators in the playoffs this year. If that happens... Uh, Soros could end up getting that sort of like best goalie, but also MVP of his team vote for the Vezina. So I like him there. And same deal for another team I think is going to be in the playoffs, the Vancouver Canucks, Thatcher Demko, who a couple of years ago uh, was probably on the uh, uh, top of the pops for people looking for Vezina candidates uh, and obviously went through an injury plague season last year. I think if the Canucks make the playoffs, it'll be because of Demko. And because of that, I think he's a Vezina candidate. Uh, Ilya Sorokin is a perennial Vezina, Vezina candidate uh, just based on his numbers alone, whether the Islanders are a playoff contending team or not. Uh, Sorokin is widely considered, uh, if not the best goaltender in the NHL, if you're just looking at that one position or in the vicinity of that conversation. So Ilya Sorokin would be my pick as the favorite just going in on paper. It's a very safe pick. I understand that, but that's what <laughs> I'm going with. Uh, my long shot is not a safe pick. I'm going Devin Levi of the Buffalo oh, Sabres. Oh, wow. I am super high on Devin Levi. Uh, I don't think that any athlete deserves or um, should deal with that like amount of pressure of people being like, you're going to be the next one, kid. Like all of our goaltending hopes and dreams are based on you. And by the way, we haven't made the playoffs in over a decade. So like no pressure there either. I get it. That's a lot to process, but Hey, he meditates in TV timeouts. I'm sure he just washes his mind away and he's just dude, perfectly fine. But if like he's dude, he's so, I feel like, he played well in college. He's played well in his limited time that we've seen him in the NHL. The potential is there. There's a buzz around that team. So I, I like this as my long shot pick, dude. If he, if the Buffalo Sabres make the playoffs on the strength of Devin Levi, he's going to win the Calder, the Vezina, the Hart, a Nobel Peace Prize. It's a team that hasn't made it since 2011. If he's the reason they make it, He's going to win all the awards. He's going to win an Oscar, a Grammy. He's going to win every <laughs> yeah. single award. He's going to have this trophy. It's like it's like those wrestlers with like 38 titles on them. Yeah. He's going to have like 18 trophies. And he's going to hold them all in the area. Yeah. That's it. He's going to um, play 65 he, games and win the EGOT. It's going to be crazy. The EGOT, um, yes. He's going to have the hockey EGOT. Uh, the Selkie <laughs> trophy. 
<laughs> Selkie, I'm taking Nico Heischer as the favorite from the Devils again, like second for the award last year behind Bergeron. Bergeron is retired. It's usually the guy that finishes second or third that moves up to win it. See Andrzej Kopitar, see Sasha Barkov. And so I think Heischer playing on what should be a very successful team in Jersey and establishing himself as one of the best two-way centers in the game. I think he's on the runway to get it. My long shot is Elias Pettersson. Um, from the Vancouver Canucks, seventh last year for the Selkie. He's starting to creep. Remember remember when everybody started talking about Austin Matthews as being like the best two-way player in the league based on how good his offense is and how underrated his defense is? It was kind of an argument Leafs fans were making because they're trying to make him better than McDavid in some way. Well, Pedersen to me is like that guy. Like I think defensively he is an incredible player, uh, has to get better on faceoffs to probably win the Selkie. But uh, I think the case will be made if the Canucks are good, that he could maybe win some award and maybe he gets that sort of like Ryan O'Reilly fake heart Selkie win. Uh, so Pedersen's my mm. long shot. I, I picked Mitch Marner as my favorite. Uh, uh, oh, to that point about being a two way play, he was third in Selkie voting last year. Uh, and I think that he, he's someone that we don't talk a lot about. Uh, in terms of his defensive prowess. I mean, if, if for all the Austin Matthews talk, Mitch Marner is terrific in the defensive yeah. zone. And he's a magician uh, with some of his passes. So I, I could see him certainly uh, as in back in the Selkie conversation. Um, I did have Elias Lindholm as my long shot. But you know what? Come to think of it, I think Patrice Bergeron has just earned the right for me to say, you know what? He comes out of retirement and just bangs out another <laughs> Selkie. That's going to be my long shot. Patrice I like Bergeron it. decides midway through the season there you go. that he's back and he's just going to, he's going to play half a year with, yeah. and he's going to win this. I, I, hey, listen, I don't think that's, that's a bad call at all, especially based on the fact that the Bruins curiously have not upgraded their center position. Maybe they're waiting for something to happen. Yeah. Uh, call the trophy for me. The favorite's obviously Connor Bedard. I mean, Bedard, if he does what we think he's going to do from a goal scoring perspective, I think he's going to score 35 plus. It's going to be hard to beat that, especially with everybody already on his tip in the preseason as far as being a, a trend a transformative player for the franchise um i don't know if he's gonna win the points race as we've talked about before but he's definitely gonna win the goals race uh long shot for me is luke hughes luke hughes uh of the new jersey devils to me is a guy that's going to be a very 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 exciting offensive player who's going to deal with the rookie learning curve defensively that being said though there's so many quality candidates at forward bedard logan cooley adam fantilli uh, Matthew Nice, name a few of them, that I think that there's a lane for someone like Luke Hughes to sneak up in there as the best rookie defenseman, much like there's a lane for Devin Levi to do the same as the best rookie goalie. Yeah, I picked uh, Fantilli as my long shot just because uh, I'm high on Columbus. You've heard this me talk about this at length <laughs> in previous podcasts. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the group of rookies is really exciting, like yeah. you said. So you could really pick anybody as a long shot, but Bedard is a lock on paper to start the season to be the Calder Trophy favorite. Um, you, you picked Luke Hughes as your long shot. I love that, the Hughes lineage, the family. Um, so that brings me to the Hart Trophy. My favorite is Jack Hughes. All right. Shocking. Surprising. Let's go. Connor McDavid exists. He could get 160 points this year, and that would obviously earn him the right to win the Hart Trophy. But I also feel that there is a world where Connor McDavid could regress, and Jack Hughes more probably will increase and be better than he was last year. He is on a great trajectory. I do feel like he could get to 110, 120 points this season, maybe hit that 50 goal plateau. He is cruising and that team is fast and plays just to his style. So I feel like this, this selection for me, wish is more based on the improvement of Hughes than the regression of McDavid. But I do want to give Jack Hughes his flowers here uh, and make him my official favorite pick. We talk about narratives before, you know, the Devils win the division, and I think they could over the Hurricanes. That's what I'm, I'm predicting. And he becomes the first 100-point goal, 100-point uh, player, rather, in the history of the Devils. The Devils have yep. never had a 100-point player. That's a very impressive narrative for him to kind of uh, plant his flag on. And, and maybe with a little McDavid regression, maybe nobody else really rises up offensively. I, I don't think that's a bad pick at all. My, my pick in favorite is McDavid. <laughs> because I don't know if he's going to regress. I, I, there might Probably not. There not. might be a ceiling we're not even sure uh, exists for this guy. Uh, I, I think Connor is just going to tear it up again this year, and and is on one of these runs like Gretzky in the '80s of just like collecting heart trophies. Uh, you didn't mention your long shot. Mine is Sidney Crosby. Uh, I think there's still the chance that Sid could pull a heart trophy out of his pocket at some point, and 
you know, maybe maybe he's the guy who keeps the Penguins steady through some some uh, injuries and gets them into the playoffs or what have you. But I, I do feel like the voters want to maybe give Sid one more crown before uh, before his, his playing days are done. Uh, but who's your long shot for the heart? I had Jason Robertson. Uh, I love his All right. I love him on the, I mean, I'm, I'm high on the stars. I think they win the central. They could win the West. Uh, and Jason Robertson is at the middle of all of that. Like uh, it. With another 40, 40 goal year, another big point total. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, someone else who was awesome, especially to deal with as a member of the media uh, in interviews and scrums and conversations was the recently retired Corey Schneider, uh, who joins us now on the drop. Very happy to be joined now, right now on the drop on ESPN. Uh, by the recently retired Corey Schneider, who had an illustrious career between the pipes in the National Hockey League, making it to the Stanley Cup Finals, playing with teams like the Vancouver Canucks, New Jersey Devils, New York Islanders. He's joining us now over Zoom. Uh, Corey, thanks for doing this, man. You are um, a free man. You are a guy with a lot of time on his hands at the free moment. <laughs> um, you are you are, you are, are yeah. someone with a lot of time on his hands. Uh, how, how does that feel, first of all? You're re like recently retired, like a days removed. Yeah, it's uh, it makes like I'm like newly single. It's like I've been unshackled from my, uh, <laughs> my job and my Not commitment. And, yeah, <laughs> no, I know. Um, no, it's it's a good feeling. It's you know I've known actually for a little while. I think around June I kind of, you know, it crystallized my head. I was like, you know what, it's uh, it's about time. We we talked about going to Europe. Maybe I have a dual citizen citizenship with Switzerland, so we talked about maybe going to play over there. And apparently, no more people over there in management positions than I realized. So I was re reached out to a few different teams. <laughs> Uh, and they showed some interest. They were looking for a veteran guy. And, uh, um, but you know, at the end of the day, I just, you know, I listened to my body. My body was kind of like, you know what, do you really want to go grind it out for 25 games in Europe when your ankle still hurts and you can't walk on your foot for some reason and <laughs> your back's acting yeah. up. So that was obviously like the, the, the main reason, but then also my family, I got two young kids going into kindergarten and second grade. So, um, they're, you know, my, my daughter's going into a new school with my son. So I was just like, is, it, is this a good idea to bring her to like an all German speaking school in Switzerland and just sort of really turn her world upside down? Cause you know, if you guys have kids, but you know, you get over there for a week and you're like, it's gonna be this great fun experience. And then they're like, I want to go home and see my friends and play with my toys. And you're like, all right, well, this wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So, um, all that combined back in June, I think we started letting some people know that, Hey, I think that's it. Uh, and then, you know, I just, I'm not the type of guy. I just didn't want to be the guy who, uh, you know, released a Twitter statement or an Instagram post announcing my retirement. You know, I just, that's just never been my jam. So um, I just, I did a, I did an article with my hometown newspaper. I'm from Marblehead, Massachusetts. So the old Salem evening news, Salem witches, uh, he'd been checking in over the summer, but like, Hey, it's been a while since we caught up. So we just caught up. So I've known him since I was 16 and just sort of told me, yeah, I think that's it for me. And he wrote an article and nothing happened and like four days later everyone picked up on it on twitter or something because all of a sudden i started getting a whole bunch <laughs> of calls and oh you're retired you announced it i'm like well i didn't really announce it i just sort of said it in an interview and yeah i am retired though so this is my announcement <laughs> man they, the players tribune weeps where's the white picture of Corey schneider looking out and, and the, the title is yeah. leaving the crease you know where's that personal <laughs> essay that we all wanted to read so your career was incredible. What 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 what, a, what an incredible journey it was for you in your career. But by the way, also we should note uh, you were responsible for one of the greatest Gary Bettman viral moments when he's in Jersey <laughs> getting booed to the high heavens, and he does the yeah. "We have a trade to announce, and you're gonna want to hear this." Yes. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about Gary. about that time in Jersey and also your time in Vancouver. Um, you know, twice in your career, you were the younger guy pushing what ended up being a Hall of Fame goalie, Roberto Luongo in Vancouver, Mar Marty Brodeur in New Jersey. How are those two situations different? Was there one more awkward than the other? How, what do you, how do you remember those two situations for you? Yeah, they were just very different points in my career. Um, so I think that was the biggest difference. You know, I was I was coming into Vancouver. Uh, Roberto just signed that 12-year deal. He'd just been named captain. Like, it was his show. It was his town. It was his city. Um, you know, he's still even, even there, he was a little polarizing, you know, the city was still split on him and I'm kind of sitting here being like, it's Roberto freaking Luongo. Like what, what's there to like be unsure about? He's one of the top five goalies in the league every year. Um, uh, but people there, you know, were, you know, for some reason he just didn't always get the, the adoration and love that he gets now. It almost seems like after he left that people fully appreciated him and his, you know, his sense of humor really came out. But, um, so for me, I was just coming in being like, man, this is terrifying. Like, this is like, you know, I had the post this guy on my wall when I was a kid. It's my first crack at the NHL, like full time. I'd been, yeah, I'd been the minors for three years. And, um, you know, throughout my career, I just, I never dreamed that this would ever happen. I always knew I was good, but ever felt like at times I was that good. So when I stepped in the room with Roberto and 
you know, I, I had a few call ups in the years prior where he got hurt. And you could tell some of the older guys, like the older guard kind of looked at me being like, yeah, you're not Roberto. I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm like, just trying not to embarrass myself in the NHL right now. So, you know, it was, it was, it was scary in that sense, like nerve wracking. Like I didn't want to let the guys down. I, you know, Roberto every night was, he'd been doing it for years. So I, you know, I wanted to come in and try to at least like come close to that and not fall on my face and lose a team game. So, you know, probably should have had a more confident mindset at first, but um, you know, to my, to Roberto's credit, like I came in, he made me feel super comfortable. Um, you know, we had a great goalie coach in Rolling Lance and, and before that Ian Clark. So the three of us working together, uh, it was a blast because Roberto just worked so hard. And for me as a young kid, 22, 23, like trying to learn how to play in the league, I was like, Oh, this guy knows how to do it. So it was, I think almost a blessing in that sense, obviously it might've, you know, delayed the start of my career in terms of being a starting goalie a few years, but um, you know, I'm sure there are other kids who've come into situations that have been pretty toxic or not ideal for goalies and just and ne- never gotten their career off the ground. So, you know, that was Roberto. It was more just a, a working relationship that I just kept learning and, and getting better and better and um, got to the point where they sort of had to make a decision. So I think that was a, a unique situation where we got along really well. And then getting traded to New Jersey, it wasn't that Marty and I didn't get along. It was just we were at very different stages of our career. He was, yeah. I think, 42 and, you know, the, the greatest of all time, you know, he, he was the New Jersey Devils. He, he represent, you know, they'd had guys throughout the years, you know, Stevens, the Danicos, the Niedermeyers, um, but Marty had been there the entire time. So I think he was like the, the visual image of, of the Devils dynasty. So, you know, here I am, they traded for me for a reason, sort of take his place eventually. Um, so I think it was a little bit different dynamic in that sense. And Marty's competitive as hell. He, he's, he's a competitor and, <laughs> he wasn't ready to, to step aside for anybody, which I appreciated too. Like there's a reason you play to your 42 and you're, you're the greatest of all time. So um, we were both buying to play. And I, and I felt at that point too, like, you know, I didn't know I was going to get traded. I didn't realize I was going to get traded. And I didn't necessarily want to get traded. I love Vancouver. They told me I was going to stay there. We had a good team. Um, so it was a bit of shock to me, but I was like, all right, well, I'm going to come here and prove myself and I want to play. You know, I've kind of sat in the sidelines for three years now and I want to play. So we both had that mindset. So I think it pushed each other though. I think again, watching him play too was, was very different than Roberto just in terms of stylistically mentality wise, like Marty, just everything rolled off his back. He just, he knew he was good. Even at 42, he's like, I'm, I'm really good. So uh, <laughs> nothing really bothered him. He was unflappable and I get why I get why he had so much success. So for me to be able to learn from both those guys is pretty incredible. I don't think many guys get to step in and play with two hall of fame goalies. And um, like I said, I had Marty's posters on my wall too. So like that, you know, I wasn't trying to fanboy over either one of them, but, uh, you know, my first day in New Jersey when I got traded, I walked into the change room and, you know, it was Marty's stall, my stall, Yammer Yager's stall. And I kind of was just like <laughs> looking up like, holy shit. He's like, where am, you know, where am I, man? Like, Could there be a better out. placement for anybody than that? Incredible. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. The best Between part is Yager's still playing, though. That's the still best playing. part. He's 50. Yeah. He's playing oh on God. his own team. He's like, he's still cracking. He, he outlasted me, so uh, I'll give him credit. <laughs> So anyways, yeah, it was, it was a good, it was a good transition, but it, it was just a different dynamic and both were, you know, I learned a lot from both of them. So I think that's the most important thing that I take away. Yeah. Quick, quick follow up about Luongo. Do you now go to a Florida practice, get on the Zamboni, chase him around a little bit? <laughs> I'm pretty forgiving. He did that to McLennan. So I think that's more McLennan's jam. I, uh, okay. Roberto ran me over at the golf cart in Columbus. So oh, next time right. I'm in Columbus, if yeah. If I see him there, I'm going to get into the one of those golf carts and hunt him down and see how he likes it. But always him um, and his backups, man. Always the uh, yeah. the battle. It was fun. Him. You know, it's yeah. there's a side of Roberto that not a lot of people got to see. So I think when we did that, it was uh, we both had a blast doing it. But I think it really showed off like his who he really was because he was a little bit guarded in Vancouver, obviously with the media scrutiny. So I think that was a great opportunity for both of us to sort of say, "Hey guys, this is you know we're cool with it. You guys seem to not be. So like we're working it out, but uh, we'll have some fun with it." You'll appreciate this. So I actually worked at the Weather mm. Network in Vancouver, and uh, there's a famous clip of Roberto getting interviewed on the street, like not as Roberto Luongo, just Roberto from Vancouver. And it's one of those like streeters where they go out on the street and ask people about the weather. And he just talks about the weather. He's like, yeah, it's a really nice sunny day. I'm enjoying going on the trails. Like he's just un- no name key, nothing. Just here's Robert, a-, a random guy in in Vancouver. And they show us this clip. They're like, don't do this. Make sure you know who you're talking to. <laughs> that was like one of the I mean, things. What not you, to do. <laughs> yeah. What not to do. Yeah. It was just really funny. I think, I think that's uh, like the, uh, 
It's like the one in Boston with Aginla. It's like a snowstorm yes. and they interviewed Jerome Aginla and exactly. they had no idea who it was. And I find that funny because Roberto is such like an identifiable person. Like he's big, he's got these big features and characteristics. Yeah. Like he just, He's not your average looking human being. So that's funny that nobody like picked up yeah. on that. Plus, plus he was wearing pads at the time. So it was really yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. That was, man. Well, I was seeing a Vancouver weather network. It's just rain every day, right? You just, it's <laughs> the easiest gig ever, Corey. It was like, oh, it's, it, yeah. it's, uh, it's uh, 50 degrees, 60 degrees. It might rain. Back <laughs> yeah. to you, Jim. That's it. Yeah, right. yeah, that's exactly. Literally if it. we get some sun. Yeah, yeah. literally yeah. it, man. Literally it. So listen, um, I worked at the Devils for a few years. You were wonderful to me, like on the other side of it, uh, on, you know, interviews, podcasts, all that stuff. Uh, you were always one of the more fun people to talk to, right? Uh, obviously, from this interview, everyone can tell, like, you're a really affable guy. Love, love, uh, you know, great interview. Love to talk. I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear you continue to talk. Have you given any, I know it's very early. I know that you're still in the glow of, hey, man, like, I just enjoy taking my kids to school and having the downtime when they are at school kind of thing. Have you given any thought of what will be next for you? Do you want to continue um, working in hockey, television, anything yeah. like that? That's a great question. I appreciate the kind words. You know, to make a redhead blush. Um, you know, it's uh, yeah, that's part of the the fun thing right now is taking the time, being with the kids. Um, they're at, again, they're at a great age. They're at six and eight this month. They both have birthdays this month, so like that's chaos. Um, you know, help my wife out. She's you know put her life on hold and supported me and followed me around doing my thing. So. Um, you know, I think it's a fun time to just sort of sit back and say, hey, wh what do you want to do with your next step? Because not a lot of people at 37 get to sort of reinvent themselves or, com you know, choose a completely different path. So, um, you know, the game's, the game's been great to me. I love I love hockey. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm interested in a lot of different aspects of it. I think for now, I'd love to just sort of stay relevant, just keep my finger on the pulse, not step too far away from it. Because I think once you get away from it for too long, you, you lose relationships, you lose what's going on in the game, you become a little outdated. Uh, and also your name just sort of loses a bit of its uh, its recognition value. So, you know, I've had some preliminary conversations to do some TV, some media, which, you know, I, I don't know if I want to do it full time right away because they just got out of that grind of doing that schedule for 16 years. That I don't know if I want to hop into like a full time TV schedule uh, again with the kids at this age where they're starting to get in activities and I don't want to miss too much of that. But, yeah, I mean, that that's part of the intrigue and the, and the thing. I, I just got off a call with my buddy uh, Brian Boyle played for a lot of years and we were sort of we've been spitballing for years about one day maybe we'll do a podcast is because we went to college together and oh nice um That'd yeah nice. played together so yeah it could be an interesting thing to just you know talk with a buddy about hockey and other stuff so um yeah everything's kind of on the table right now i don't want to make any firm decisions and obviously my family has a say in that and just in terms of what they want to do what we want to do as a unit and uh you know we go from there but i you know fortunately very blessed where i don't have to rush into something right away you know it was um, very lucky to make enough money where I can take some time and sort of figure out what it is I want to do instead of being forced into doing something you don't want to do. So I think that's the greatest gift that hockey's probably given me so far. You're going to have to give Arda and me some time to process that it's going to be yet another two dudes talking about hockey podcasts and have to compete against. <laughs> I don't jump into that. Hey, yeah. 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 Podcast part, Corey, Corey, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. Corey, last one. For... Boston College thing. <laughs> last one for me Corey uh like you said it's been you know 16 great years uh it is a grind but it's also a very unique position that you played in the National Hockey League and I was wondering from your perspective how has goaltending changed since 2008 what are the things that have happened for the better for the worse what is that position now versus when you broke into the league that's a great question because um you know I kind of came in at the end of that you know blocking era the guys with the huge huge equipment and just dropping and blocking and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's become so much more athletic. It's, and it, it's had to, cause the game is, you know, the players, the skill level, the speed, it's all increased. And, uh, you know, I was a part of the competition committee back in whatever it was 2013 when we reduced the, the goalie gear. So I was on that committee in those conversations, like shedding a tear, but understanding like it had to happen because the gear was getting a little outrageous. <laughs> so, um, you know, I knew it might hurt me at some point, but I, you know, I figured if they're going to do it with, with or without us, we may as well be involved and try to have some say in it. So uh, I think between that and just the pace of the game, it's like, you know, I came in the league in 2000, or I got drafted in 2004 and I was six foot two and I was a big goalie. And now I'm like an average size goalie with average athleticism. You know, there's guys who are six, four, six, five, who move better than I did when I was in my prime. So um, I think that the, the, misnomer of goalies just being like the worst player you stick in the net and they just fall it's completely over like these guys are athletes like you see every you see one every now and then doesn't have a great body or you're kind of like how do you stop pucks but you know some of these kids are just physical specimens and they just can do things with their bodies that i just never even that i can't even envision happening so 
Um, it's really become a very refined athletic position that takes a lot of mental strength because the, just the, like I said, the night to night, you know, you used to be able to like pencil in your wins. Like, all right, we're going to go here. We're going to play the backup. We're going to win that game. You know, we're gonna, now it's like yeah. every night to track me. And if you're not dialed in and you're not, you know, on top of your game, you're going to get embarrassed. It's going to be a seven, five shootout and you might win, but you don't feel very good about yourself after the game. So <laughs> I think just the amount of mental stamina and, and concentration that these guys have to have, uh, you know, it used to be if a kid came down with a grade A chance, he was going to shoot it and you could just be ready for that. Now he's going to like look you off and be like, mm, I got something better here. Let me pull up and see who else is coming and I'm going to pass it to him. And you're like, wait, what? Like, why wouldn't you shoot that puck? So <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was one of the biggest changes for me is guys is passing up grade A's to look for a better grade A. I'm like, wait, and they can do it. And it's like, yeah, this. Is, so you just always have to be on your feet. You have to you have to maintain your edge work and your balance and. Uh, play more on your toes than ever because if you go down too early, you commit too soon, like guys will just make you look silly now. So uh, I have a lot of respect for the goalies who put up, you know, nine twenties year after year can keep it down around two goals against like you had a lot of those in the 2010s when I was playing, you don't have a lot of those these days. And I think there's a reason why. One last question, actually, that just uh, popped into my head before we let you go here. We always talk about like Austin Matthews and even Connor Bedard now, like the deception of the shot. How much has that improved? Uh, even in the over the course of your career and what you're seeing now in today's NHL, massively. It's it's you know, again when I came in, it was you had the top six, you had your checking line, and you had your grinders. So basically, like six guys on the ice were a threat, and then the other six, you know, you could take or leave, I guess. Uh, and not, no disrespect to those guys, they can still shoot and play, but like now you have twelve forwards and four to six defensemen who can all make plays and shoot the puck. And um, I think there's so much emphasis now on release points and even sticks now guys like I see guys using junior sticks that are like a 50 flex. They're just like wet noodles in their hands, but they just lean on them and the puck just, just flings off their stick and you can't read it because they're not really leaning on it. They're just like whipping it. Um, and so I think guys pay a lot more attention to that stuff now than they ever did. And um, that was one thing that I had to make a big adjustment when I got bought out from New Jersey and, and went to long Island, you know, I had to sit down with Mitch Korn and Piero Greco and they showed me some video from practice because I didn't get to play much that year. Um, and they were just like, yeah, so like you're lined up with him, but then he changes the angle of his, of his stick blade by two feet. And now you're a foot and a half off your angle. So even I, at that age, I had to make that adjustment to like, learn how to, you know, shift with these kids because everyone was changing the angle of the shot. Nobody shoots it. Nobody takes slap shots anymore. Nobody just takes quick snappers. Like they all take it and tow it or push it and pull it. And, um, it's really hard to do when they're coming down at you at 15, 20 miles an hour and you, or you're getting ready for the shot and you have to move six to eight inches while you're still in your stance. So that was even something at my age that I had to get better at and adjust and learn. Cause I was trying to like, I feel like I'm on it, but I'm still getting beat. And they're like, yeah, it's cause they've changed the angle by six to eight inches, which for you is like a foot. So like you have to make that adjustment. So I, to your point, they're also good at manipulating the angle and, and the positioning of their, of their shot. That as a goalie, you just, you can't zero in and just like stay still and focus. You always have to be making subtle adjustments, even as the shots coming, which again, it, it's, it's a huge challenge. Hockey cool. nerds like us love that kind of conversation. You would be great on TV, dude. I know that you're making some, th um, you know, putting some thought into things. I'm just saying, man, you make a great analyst on TV. Uh, yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Sure. You better have a face for radio, so that's the only issue. <laughs> hey, so does yeah, Mashinsky, yeah. and he gets on TV every that's now That's true. I, uh, I, I <laughs> take it until you make it, Corey. That's right. Uh, exactly. Corey, uh, you had a great career. We enjoyed watching you in the NHL, and now we can't wait to see what's next for you. Enjoy the time with the family. Thanks for joining us here on well, The Drop, and all the best in retirement. You got it, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks again to Corey Schneider for joining us on the show. Uh, he definitely would make a great TV analyst. Oh, absolutely. He was fantastic. And I'm happy whenever we can get our hockey nerd on with a former goaltender. Uh, we have to end the show on a very sad note. Calgary Flames assistant general manager Chris Snow passed away at the age of 42 after a lengthy public battle with Lou Gehrig's disease. There are certain things that transcend hockey, transcend sports. Chris Snow was respected all across the sports world. But when he was diagnosed with ALS in 2019, his wife, Kelsey, chronicled the painful journey of Chris's fight. Every hospital visit, every struggle endured just to have another dance with his daughters in his living room. Every ounce of energy mustered just to mow the lawn. Each post, each podcast episode, both heartbreaking and inspiring. Hope in the face of inevitability. A reminder to hug and kiss your loved ones, 
as Chris battled so hard to do every day. He left this world way too soon, at the age of 42. ALS does not define his journey. He shall be remembered for his incredible courage. The family saying, improvise and overcome. Even in death, Chris did one last selfless act, as he was known to do, donating his organs so that others may continue to live. His story and his memory shall live on forever. Thanks for tuning into The Drop. And don't forget our live studio show on Tuesday, October 10th at 5 p.m. Eastern before the season opens on streaming platforms and ESPN+.